Hello, you're listening to a sermon from Community Church in Prague, Oklahoma. At Community Church, we are all about loving God as a community and loving people in our community. If you live in the area, we would love for you to join us on a Sunday morning for coffee and fellowship at 9.30 or for service at 10 a.m. And now, here is our pastor, Wopsle, with part two of our series, Advent. We are in um, week two of our Advent series, which is when we're going into, uh, we're talking about peace. And really to kind of define peace, um, I I think a good way to define peace is to talk about what peace is not. And I experienced what peace is not this past week. We had a dryer go out, which automatically having your clothes, wet clothes in the washer and the dryer not being able to dry is already a part where it's like, okay, I'm kind of feeling uneasy, right? But then I figured out. I actually called the local repairman and he told me, I think you can fix it yourself. And I was like, I disagree, but let's do it. And so I decided I'm going to try to fix the dryer myself, uh, uh, get it out to the garage and I'm taking the parts, you know, and there's just probably, I don't know, 60 screws. I'm just taking, got this stuff all over the garage. And on the phone, he had told me that there's a bolt on the fan for the motor that you're going to need an impact drill for. And I have a little Ryobi impact drill. It's not that strong, but it's, I figured, okay, that'll do it, right? So I get down there. I mean, pieces are just everywhere. It's a mess, but I get to the bolt. This is the last thing I have to take off. And I, I, I of course, I, I put my impact drill on there. I do it, and the whole thing spins, right? Well, okay. So then I got to figure out a way to keep it from spinning. I actually jammed a, a, a screwdriver in there and did it, and it just ripped all the, all the things off to shreds. It was the old motor, so it was okay. But so... Um, so I'm like, okay, you know, I, uh, the, the peace level is dropping pretty significantly at this point, right? So then I got some some vice grips because they would hold the put, and I got all this stuff, and I just kept on doing it, and it wasn't budging. And I was like, I guess my drill, my, my impact drill isn't strong enough, right? And listen, there are times when I'm close to Jesus and act a lot like Jesus, and um, appliance repair is not those times for me. I mean, I was getting more and more angry. I don't think any cuss words came out of my mouth, but they were certainly up in my head. And I'm just like, why is this dryer, not, not only the dryer, but the specific bolt, why is this ruining not only my Christmas season, but my life? This is the worst thing that has ever happened. I was so upset and so mad at this one bolt. So I go in, I'm stomping around, I'm kicking stuff, and I finally Google What's the deal with this bolt? Like, what kind of drill do I need for this? And some of you guys already probably know what the deal is, right? This particular bolt is reverse threaded. So if you don't know what that means, here's what it is. Every screw, every bolt, everything in the world is righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Except for this one bolt (laughs) in my dryer. (laughs) And so I had been tightening it with my impact drill more and more and more and more and more. And so it's, anyway, I turned it the other way. It actually came off pretty easy, and I fixed it, and I was the hero, and everything was pretty good. But the time between finding that bolt until finally realizing it was reverse threaded, it's the worst time of my year. Like it's literally the worst 10 or 15 minutes I've had of my entire year. Peace was nowhere to be found. And that was just a little window for me. You may have a little window right now where peace is nowhere to be found. You may have your whole year. I tell you, for most people, my experience is 2023 has been a tough year to find peace. It's just been a weird and tough year for a lot of us. And so today, I'm not going to promise you're going to leave here with the most peace that you could ever experience and everything's going to be fine. Because that's kind of not how it works. But I am going to, I think, hopefully, we're going to look in the Bible and see a way that God wants to give us peace if we'll just look up and we'll receive it. So I think, so, so peace isn't fixing your dryer with the reverse thread bolt. So what is peace? I, th- I think sometimes if we were asked to define peace, we would talk about maybe kind of tranquility, right? Peace is you're on a beach, and everything's taken care of, and the bank account looks good, and the kids are probably somewhere learning something valuable, but they're not with me right now, you know, and um, it's just everything's great. And certainly, right, that, that probably is peace. I would, if you wanted to give me that version of peace today, I would go ahead and take it. But I also think that maybe sometimes peace, in the midst of peace, right, feeling peace next to the beach I feel like that peace is maybe sort of lost because peace in the midst of trouble or peace in the midst of things not going well, that peace seems to be kind of heightened, 
compared to peace in the middle of peace. Here's kind of an example that I have. It's, it's dumb like all my examples, so it should resonate with all of us. Um, it's kind of like this flashlight. Well, it's pretty bright up here. We've got these stage lights, so I can barely see you all. It's bright outside. So if I turn this flashlight on, doesn't make a lot of difference, does it? I mean, you, you all can see, right? It's on, but I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just, there's so much light up here that more light doesn't really move the needle very much, does it? Other than hearing me click it, you would have no idea if it's on or off. It's just, it's already pretty well lit, and then now more light just doesn't do much. And I kind of think sometimes peace, listen, peace in the middle of a whole bunch of peace, when everything is so peaceful and everything is great, right? The cattle are lowing, you know, the baby's not even making a noise, and peace in the middle of that is like, well, that's fine. But it's, it's kind of not much, right? Whereas finding peace in the middle of mess, like the peace is heightened, the peace is brighter, the peace is, is, stands out more. When God gives us peace in the midst of our trouble, when it doesn't make sense to everything else, when people from the outside looking would say, that person should not be experiencing peace, but yet they are, that kind of peace shows up. That moves the needle. That really makes a difference. Last month, we went through the book of Philippians, and it keeps on coming back in my quiet times and in my preparation time. And one of the verses, that's probably the best verse in Philippians that we skipped over, is Philippians 4, 7. This is what it says. It says, and the peace of God, okay, so the peace of God, what's it going to do? Which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this peace of God, which does not make sense given the circumstances, Right, Peace that you can understand, peace that makes sense because everything is going your way and everything is, is great, well, that's not really that impressive. But the peace that God gives us it transcends all understanding that doesn't make sense because our circumstances should be no peace, and yet we have peace anyway, that's a special kind of peace. Peace in the middle of mess is really something special. So if you come in here today in the middle of a mess, I hope that God's got some peace for you. We're going to get to today's verses, picking up right after last week. So we're only in Luke 1, going through Advent, marching up to the birth of Jesus. Uh, so we're going to pick up in Luke 1, verse 26, where we left off last week. This is what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town of, uh, in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Mary will be the kind of the star of today's story, so pay attention to her. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, I always kind of laugh at this a little bit because an angel shows up and she's troubled at his words. And you look at his words, which part do you think made her upset so much? You are highly favored? Or the Lord is with you. Because either one of those two things seem pretty good to me. Like those aren't troubling. I'm like, yeah, this is great. I'm highly favored. I did something right. Sweet. Right? So why was Mary so troubled that the angel would say, greetings, which seems pretty kind. You are highly favored. Cool. The Lord is with you. This is a great day. And yet Mary's response is troubled. Why would she be troubled? I think maybe it's kind of like if you own a truck and I call you for the first time in about 18 months. You know why I'm calling you for the first time in about 18 months, don't you? It's because I need your truck, okay? I wished, I will ha wish that I had kept up the relationship better, but the truth is, you know I need something when I hadn't heard from you, and then you answer, you know, and listen, here's what I would say. If you answered the phone after 18 months and I needed your truck, you know the first thing I would say? Hey, greetings. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Man, if you lost weight, you look great, right? I'd really, really butter you up a whole lot knowing that there's an ask coming down the road that I maybe ne haven't necessarily earned. Now, the Lord has probably earned the ask, but like we talked about last week, um, God's been silent for 500 years. So not only had God not spoken to Mary, God hadn't spoken to people. 
In 500 years between the end of the Old Testament and now the, the Holy Spirit beginning to show up and work in people's lives. So God had not spoken to Mary uh, in quite a while. Now he shows up and he's like, hey, how are things going? Looking good, Mary. And she's like, she's troubled because she knows the Lord needs her to do something. I'm comforted by this part of the story because sometimes when God calls me to something, I'm troubled that my first reaction is, oh man, or uh, wh- what, what, what now, right? Sometimes it takes me a while to come around. And I love Mary here because her initial reaction isn't, okay, awesome, I'm on board. She's, she's troubled at what might be happening here. And and we all, I think we have this inaccurate picture of the heroes of the Bible, that they get it and they're on it and they don't have any blemishes on their record, but yet we see Mary here being troubled before she's asked. I love Peter in the Bible because he keeps on messing it up, right? Peter's the only one that walked on water other than Jesus. He's also the only one that sank, right? Peter, uh, whenever Jesus said, hey, uh, uh, whenever they, they came to arrest Jesus, Peter cut off a dude's ear and Jesus is like, whoa, Peter, calm down, dude. This is supposed to happen, and he heals the dude's ear. That's pretty cool. Jesus said, hey, some of you are going to leave me. And Peter said, I will never leave you, Lord. I will never say I don't know you. And then while Jesus is hanging on the cross, Peter denies that he even knows him at all. Peter keeps on messing it up, and yet he is the rock that Jesus chose to build the church on, that same Peter. A person I've always loved, Thomas, because he's a thinker. He followed Jesus around. He was a disciple. He saw Jesus do all this incredible stuff. Jesus dies on the cross. And then after he raises, someone goes and says, hey, Thomas, Jesus is alive. And what's Thomas' response? I don't think so. I, I, can't, I, I, I won't believe that unless I have hard physical evidence. He actually says, I want to put my finger in the hole in his hand. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe it. He, these weren't just heroes that had some supernatural ability to follow and be faithful automatically. No, they were people that were wrestling with it just the same way that you and I do. And so if God has ever called you to something and your initial reaction was, oh man, I don't know about that, God, you're in good company because that was Mary's response too. So let's keep going and see. So she's troubled, we know that. Let's keep going in verse 30 and see what she says. It says, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And now he lays out the game plan for her. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So that's the game plan, right? In verse 34, she says, How will this be? Mary asked the angel since I am a virgin. Now, if you were here last week, you may be worried, right? Because an angel told Zechariah, hey, you're going to have a baby. And he asked a question and we really got on his case a lot last week about that, right? Because Zechariah had a hard time believing that God was going to do the things that God said he's going to do, that God was going to answer the prayers that Zechariah and his Elizabeth, his wife Elizabeth had been praying. Whenever Zechariah asked the question, it was kind of a little bit more of a, yeah, right, God. Like, yeah, right, angel, I don't believe what you're saying. And and I think Mary's objection is a little bit different here. Because she's she is kind of hers is kind of a more, but but how are we gonna do this, God? And maybe I just like the idea of Zechariah being an idiot and Mary being a little bit more of a hero, right? I might be kind of uh, bent to that idea, but we also do see we see that Mary doesn't get any consequences for her questions. Zechariah did, remember? He had to be silent until the baby was born. So, and Mary, she asked a question, and she seems to not really get in trouble for it. Um, Also, we see Zechariah, again, he was like, I don't believe you. Whereas Mary just says, how is this going to be since I'm a virgin? I think Mary probably has a little bit better here than Zechariah did because her question is kind of pragmatic. For an angel to tell Zechariah, hey, you and your wife are going to get pregnant, it's a tall order because they were kind of old, but there's a way that married couples sometimes get pregnant. It's not that out of the ordinary. So maybe it wasn't, Zechariah shouldn't have been like, I don't believe it. You know, it's not that crazy. Whereas I think Mary's question here is pretty, pretty on the nose, right? I don't know if you've ever talked to a teenager that's engaged or any young person that's about to be engaged at all, but most of them have one thing on their mind. 
And to be frank, it has to do with the part of the process that the angel seems to be cutting out right here, right? So Mary's probably like, okay, wait, so you're saying like we're going to get married and then I'm just going to get pregnant early because sometimes that happens, right? Or, or how is this really going to work? Of course, the angel says, well, here's the plan, uh, and it does not involve you and Joseph. It involves the Holy Spirit doing something special in your life, and she, I'm sure, was kind of bummed about that. But I think, <laughs> I, I think sometimes God speaks clearly. I'm not trying to be blue. I'm just saying... <laughs> I'm just saying, she was probably like, oh, she probably thought this was going to be a good thing. Oh, God, how are you going to do this, though? What's going to happen? And he's like, you're just going to wake up pregnant tomorrow. And she's like, oh, man. That's like the worst way for this version of the story to go. Before me and my family moved back to Prague, um, this was a little over about a year and a half ago, two years almost now, uh, we felt like God gave us a pretty clear vision why to come back. There was a, a, a segment of the preg population that was wanted a church that kind of didn't really exist yet. We felt like God gave us a, a pretty uh, sincere vision for what that church should be. And so we got ready to come and, and we really had a pretty specific way that we thought that plan was going to go. There was a roadmap that made a lot of sense. It was the way that it could have happened and maybe should have happened. And so we said, yes, God, we see this clear path you have for us. So we're going to walk along this clear path. And that's not at all what God did. Everything has looked very, very, very different than we thought it was. And we are praising God daily for what is happening, what he is doing through the relationships here. And I have more people to call on and love me now than I've ever had in my entire life. And this is just me personally, and I know that's true for so many of you as well. <clears throat> the way we are able to dig into the Bible together, the way it's, it's just, just incredible. The way that you all love my kids and the way that hopefully other people in this room love your kids and your grandkids, it's just something really spectacular. So I stand here today so grateful for what God has done, but, but I've said a couple of times that if God had shown me the whole plan at the beginning, I might not have said yes when he showed it to me. Because it was a lot different than I thought. It was a lot harder than I thought. He didn't do all the things the way that I had told him I thought that he should do them. And so it's like, God, you want me to do this? Cool. Here's how I'm going to do it. If he had said, no, also not that way, a totally different way, I might have been like, well, fine, then find somebody else. You know, I'd go do my own thing. And I hope I would have done it anyway, but I don't know that I would have. And so here we see Mary is given this charge. What an incredible gift that she has been given to be the one to carry the Messiah in her womb and to birth this baby Jesus. And so she says, there is a normal plan for babies to be born. Is it going to look something like that? Basically, the angel says, no, it's not. And then here's Gabriel's further explanation in verse 35. He does not give her very many details. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That's all he gave her. Hey, she said, hey, how is this going to be? I know a way that this could happen. May I suggest it happening naturally with me and my husband? And the angel says, actually, God's going to do it. Are you in? That's all I can give you. And then, again, I find a lot of humor in the Bible. I, I got a feeling maybe she still had a look on her face. Maybe she wasn't totally convinced yet that this could happen just by the Lord just doing it. So in verse 36, he says, he adds this explanation. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, and she who uh, was said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month, uh, for no word from God will ever fail. So I love this. He says, you think a virgin having a baby's crazy? What about your old aunt? She's having a baby. That's even, she's like, she's like, okay, well, I guess if my old aunt can have a baby, a virgin's not that tall of an order. It seems to be, seems to be the angels uh, convincing here because then her response to that is, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is a pretty difficult assignment without a lot of real details about how this is going to go. 
But here, Mary seems at peace. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Let's, let's do it. So then once Mary is at peace with this, she goes to the six. It's a little bit of, of a zag from our sermon, but I don't want to cut it out because I think it's really important. She, so the angel just told her that Elizabeth was pregnant. This is the first time she had heard that, right? So Mary goes to spend time with her pregnant family member. She's three months ahead of her, six months ahead of her, sorry. So she can kind of hear about, you know, what's going on? What's the first trimester like? What's, you know, you craved mustard? Cool, I'm craving avocados, whatever. She could have this relationship and this conversation with Elizabeth, which remember, we talked about her last week. She is um, Zechariah's wife. She's become uh, miraculously pregnant as well, although not quite as miraculous as Mary's. Still miraculous nonetheless. And I bet maybe Mary went there because if you remember, Zechariah couldn't talk. So she knew there'd be some peace and quiet because there was a, a silent guy living with them, taking care of all their needs. And I love this interaction when Mary shows up. Luke 1, verse 39. It says, um, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. We could probably do a whole series on this idea of Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit um, hovered above the waters with God and Jesus before creation. The Holy Spirit, it says, is the one that um, was in the burning bush speaking. The Holy Spirit led the way by a, a tornado in the day and a pillar of fire at night for the Israelites as they walked out. Um, the Holy Spirit kind of showed up in these places outside of people in the Old Testament. And then way over here, after in the New Testament, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit now is not outside of here. It's in us, and it's in me, and it's in you. And when we speak words to one another, that can be the Holy Spirit using our voice box to encourage somebody else. The Holy Spirit is, is in us. And so we've got, we've got the Holy Spirit outside of us but directing us. We've got the Holy Spirit in us, changing us and the people around us. And here we have this little middle time where the Holy Spirit shows up sometimes, but Nobody had had it in them before. Nobody had, had lived. Nobody had experienced so much of this Holy Spirit time right here. And I, it says Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit from the barely pregnant Mary showing up and speaking to her. In a loud voice. So this is Elizabeth's response to the Holy Spirit feeling her. Again, giving her these words to say. She says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. I think this is cool for so many different ways, but the biggest thing is because this baby that's leaping in the womb would grow up to be John the Baptist who would prepare the way for Jesus. He's the one out in the wilderness baptizing people, and then Jesus would show up, and he's like, hey, man, you should baptize me. And John's like, whoa, no, man. When Jesus walks up, he says, behold, the, the lamb. Like, this is the Messiah. He's coming. He's the first one to kind of proclaim that. And then Jesus says, no, I need you to baptize me. This is all a part of it. This is John leaping in the womb is the same John preparing the way in the desert that would baptize Jesus. And again, back to the Holy Spirit, Jesus goes down and comes out of the water. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended on him. And then you hear God from heaven saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. The Trinity is all in this moment. It's really cool. And all kinds of spiritual significance is happening. And it's all kind of because of the, the ushering in that John the Baptist did and all the way back to we see John and Jesus were kind of cousins, um, and all the way back, John is leaping in his mother's womb. Man, that's cool. Doesn't have very much to do with peace, but it's cool. <laughs> but today we're going to finish with this idea of peace. Mary, she seems to be at peace with what is happening to her. We're going to continue talking about Mary next week, but for now, I just want to pause in this place of her being told she has this big job, this big, scary thing to do. She's not given a lot of the details about it, and she's just invited to just kind of be calm, to take a breath, and just peacefully follow. That seems to be what she's done. So I, I ask you this morning, what about you? 
don't just let me ask you. Maybe let the Holy Spirit prompt you. What about you? Do you have peace this Advent season? Do you need peace in some areas of your life? Maybe is there something God has called you to that you're troubled by? Hey, so am I, and so is Mary. That's okay. Or is there a situation that God seems to be absent from? You say, God, you promised to never leave me or forsake me, and now I'm looking around, and you don't seem to be very close. And it's hard to find peace in that. Where is it that you need peace from God today in this Advent season? You know, earlier we read that verse about peace from Philippians 4.7. Um, we probably left out the most important part, which is Philippians 4.6. That's kind of the key to unlocking this peace that we find in verse 7. This is what it says. Philippians 4, this is 6 and 7, talking about the peace of God. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, and here's what it is, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. And then what? The part we read earlier. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding and does not make any sense to the world, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I guess this week we're ending kind of the same place we ended last week, aren't we? If you need peace, are you talking to God about peace? Are you asking God for peace? Are you looking up and ready to receive peace? In every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, are you presenting your request for peace to God and saying, God, everything is crazy. This has been a year that I don't know that I am still able to make it through. Without your peace, God, please come. If you're crying that cry out, even if you're asking for a peace that doesn't make sense in your circumstances, God's word promises that that peace will come to you. We pray to God with a grateful heart. And then what I love is we don't just receive peace magically. God gives us his peace as a gift. And if you have this gift of peace waiting for you this Advent, then your role is simply to open it. So would you open that gift this, this season? Let me pray for us, church. God, we know in this room where there are dozens and dozens of different hearts, different perspective. God, we've all had different years. We know that you see each one of us individually as your children, that you care so deeply about where we are at, God. So we just pray, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would come in and move in power and just remind us that you are close. God, it's hard for us to find peace if we feel like that you are distant. So just remind us that you are a good Father, that you are here close, and that you are for us, God. That you may not give us every single in and out and all the details of the plan, but God, we trust that you do have a plan. And then it is for our good. It is to prosper us and not to harm us. It is to give us a hope and a future, God. Even though we can't see the details of that hope and future, give us peace, God, that that hope and future is there. God, for those in the room that this Christmas season is magnified in a bad way, God, that the hurts hurt more, that the darkness is darker, God, that the that the bad things in our life seem like they're worse and that there is no end. God, I just pray that you would come in, that through your Holy Spirit you would minister to us, but also wrap those in this room that feel that way, wrap them up with your people. God, let them have a kind word or a smile or a hug on the way out of here. Let us um, put them on someone's mind that they would just text them on Tuesday and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, let their coworkers know that something is going on. God, put people the way that only you can in their way that they would be interrupted and reminded of your love for them and the peace that only you can give, God. God, we all look to you this Advent season. God, just like Mary didn't know everything, but she said yes. God, let us say yes to the things that you're doing in our lives. Let us be a community of people that shows the world what peace can look like even when stuff 
doesn't make sense. Let our peace surpass all understanding, not for our comfort or glory, but to point people to you, God, because it's all about you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all these prayers. Amen. Thank you.